Good afternoon. The first item of business is a statement by John Swinney on an update on Scotland's public finances. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of the statement and there should be therefore no interruptions or interventions. Uh, Deputy First Minister, about 10 minutes. So I'm grateful for the opportunity today to update Parliament on Scotland's public finances, as well as using this opportunity to respond to yesterday's UK spending review and its implications for Scotland. I will also provide an update on the fiscal framework which will underpin the Scotland Bill, the outlook for devolved taxes and our NPD and hub investment programme. Yesterday, the Chancellor set out his spending plans for the period 2015-16 to 2020-21. These spending plans clearly show that the Chancellor has continued with a programme of austerity, with deep cuts to spending on business, transport, local government and the environment. Looking ahead, our fiscal resource Dell budget, our budget for day-to-day -day spending in Scotland, will decrease in real terms by almost 6% over the next four years. Taken with the cuts imposed in recent years, this means that by, by 2019-20, the Scottish Government's total discretionary budget will be £3.9 billion, or around 12.5% lower in real terms than it was in 2010-11. Whilst we recognise the need to ensure the public finances are on a sustainable footing, the scale of the cuts is unnecessary. The Scottish Government has consistently advocated an alternative approach that would ensure the deficit is reduced whilst also allowing for significant additional investment in public services compared to the Chancellor's plans. Instead, the Chancellor has continued to pursue an ideologically driven programme of austerity. There were three specific decisions in the statement on which I would like to comment today. Firstly, the decision to scrap the proposed changes to tax credits was a welcome change of direction. The proposed cuts were targeted at working families on low incomes and would have affected around 250,000 households in Scotland. This is a victory for those who campaigned against these cuts and highlights the importance of continuing to voice opposition to UK Government policy. This Government remains steadfast and focused on defeating the tax credit cuts. However, the Chancellor was clear that planned £12 billion of cuts to welfare in future years will still go ahead. Delayed cuts are still cuts. The Chancellor should cease his unnecessary attack on those on benefits and protect rather than punish those who find themselves in need of financial support. The Scottish Government will continue to do all that it can to protect the most vulnerable in society from the UK's austerity programme and will continue to pressure the UK Government to reverse these cuts. Secondly, the Chancellor announced welcome increases in capital spending, which will see our ability to invest in long-term infrastructure investment enhanced over the spending review period. We need, however, to see this improvement in the capital position in its proper context. By 2019-20, our capital Dell budget will still be lower in cash terms than it was when the Conservatives came to office 10 years previously. Thirdly, the decision to scrap the carbon capture and storage proposal that could have been taken forward at Peterhead is a short-sighted decision that undermines a global economic opportunity for Scotland. We are making the strongest possible representations to the UK Government to reverse this decision. I will set out the Government's budget proposals to Parliament for consultation on the 16th of December. I now turn to provide a brief update on devolved taxation. Our forecasts for devolved tax receipts for 2015-16 were considered by the Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission, who endorsed them as a reasonable assessment. Revenues from land and buildings transaction tax remain on track and in line with our expectations. We forecast total LBTT revenues of £381 million in 2015-16 before allowing for forestalling losses and we have collected around £218 million for the first seven months of the tax. The Scottish Fiscal Commission provided an assessment of devolved tax outturn against forecast to the Finance Committee yesterday. That assessment supports our view that overall LBTT revenues remain in line with expectations. Revenues from Scottish landfill tax are performing well against our original forecast of £117 million. Over £37 million was declared for the first quarter of 2015-16. Revenue Scotland will publish data for the second quarter tomorrow morning. The Office for Budget Responsibility published updated forecasts for devolved taxes. These have no bearing on our budget, our forecasts or our revenues, but I do welcome the fact that these are now more closely aligned with the forecasts of the Scottish Government. I continue to discuss the fiscal framework with the UK Government with regard to those taxes that are due to be devolved under the Scotland Bill. 
These discussions are focused on securing a fair and workable outcome on a financial settlement that is faithful to the recommendations made and principles articulated by the Smith Commission. Smith was absolutely clear that the Barnett formula should continue as the major determinant of Scotland's spending power and that Scotland's budget should no be no larger or smaller simply as a result of further devolution. The risks of an unfair fiscal framework were made clear last week by the Scottish Trade Union Congress and Professor Anton Muscatelli, the principal of Glasgow University. Professor Muscatelli warned that changes to funding methods that did not properly reflect the Smith Commission's recommendations could leave Scotland worse off by hundreds of millions of pounds. These are credible, independent voices who should be listened to. We need a fiscal framework that will ensure, as the Smith Commission intended, that further devolution provides the right incentives and increases the accountability of the Scottish Parliament, linking the Scottish Government's, Scottish Government's budget to Scottish economic performance. Scotland should retain the rewards of her success in the same way that we must bear the risks into the bargain. It is absolutely essential that the fiscal framework allows us to pursue our own distinct policies that meet the needs and wishes of the people of Scotland and do not tie us to UK Government policies. We aim to complete this work as soon as possible in order to give respective parliaments time for due consideration of both the fiscal framework and the Scotland Bill. But without a framework that is fair to the people of Scotland, I have been clear that the Scottish Government will not recommend that Parliament approves the Scotland Bill. Presiding officer, I'd like to conclude by updating Parliament on our engagement with the Office of National Statistics about the impact of recent updates to EU accounting guidance on the Government's infrastructure programme. I advised Parliament on the 9th of September that the Scottish Futures Trust had submitted proposals for revised arrangements for the hub model to the ONS. I am today able to advise Parliament that the ONS has offered the view that the proposed model would be classified to the private sector. This means that I am able today to advise relevant local authorities and health boards that they can proceed to contract award with hub projects under the revised model. Confirmation of a private sector classification from the ONS means that Scottish Government support for these projects can be drawn from long-term resource deal budgets as intended. The revised arrangements for the hub programme will maintain the current balance of public good with projects taken forward by special purpose companies owned 60% by the existing hub par private partners, 20% by a charity, 10% by SFT and 10% by the procuring authority. More widely in the NPD programme, it has become clear that a rapid reversal of the ONS's public classification of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route project under the revised Eurostat rules will not be possible. I have asked SFT to continue to review options for the potential amendment of the AWPR project and potentially other NPD projects in light of the Office for National Statistics welcome decision on the revised hub model. The Scottish Government also continues to discuss the budgeting implications with Her Majesty's Treasury, including for our capital spending plans, and I intend to reflect the outcomes of these discussions in the budget in December. This will have no impact on the delivery of the project itself. It is on time and it is on budget. The Scottish Government has always prioritised public infrastructure projects as a critical tool for growing our economic recovery. I am therefore delighted to be able to confirm that the 10 school and two health centre projects within the hub programme will now proceed. That is around £330 million of capital investment in our children's education, our NHS and Scotland's economy. These, these 12 projects will make an enormous difference in their communities, both in terms of the immediate boost provided by the jobs that their construction will bring, but also through the long-term health and education benefits that these projects will provide to local communities and to local people. Presiding officer, while the Scottish Government welcomes the Chancellor's U-turn in relation to tax credits, we will continue to argue for the Chancellor to abandon his policy of austerity and make the case for greater emphasis on public sector investment. We remain committed to investing in our infrastructure and public services, and the ONS decision on the Hub programme allows us to continue on that track by moving forward with pro projects previously on hold. When we set out our plans for the Scottish Budget next month, we will be driven by our principles of establishing a system that is fair and progressive and creating a sustainable economy that ensures opportunities for all within Scotland.
Thank you. The Deputy First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. Members wish to ask a question of the Deputy First Minister should press the request people. But now, Jack Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister for an advance copy of his statement. Let me start by welcoming the dramatic U-turn from the Tories on tax credits. Labour campaigned long and hard to reverse cuts to tax credits, but the Chancellor will, however, still be making cuts that affect some of the poorest in our society. Order. Now, both Labour and the SNP are anti-austerity. There is no doubt that this is a difficult budget settlement, and there are tough choices ahead. And I want to focus on how we deal with some of those choices and protect people from austerity, which is an ambition that I believe is shared. We have new powers now from the Scotland Act 2012, and there'll be substantial new powers coming um, in the future. Scottish Labour have set out some of the choices we would make with air passenger duty, a top rate of income tax, all progressive measures. So I am disappointed that the Deputy First Minister looks like he's only setting out plans for one year. Surely if we're serious about the sustainability of the nation's finances and using our new powers, we should have a full Scottish comprehensive spending review. He knows the numbers for the next three years, so why can't he tell us the outline plans? And surely he should take the opportunity to consider how the new powers can be used to protect people from austerity. Finally. The Deputy First Minister is no shrinking violet. I expect him to stay the course in the negotiations on the fiscal framework to secure a good deal for Scotland. Deputy First Minister. Um, first of all, uh, can I say that uh, I, I welcome Jackie Bailey's remarks in relation to the uh, question of a difficult budget settlement. It's, it's perhaps the start of um, an acceptance by the Labour Party that some of the choices that have to be made on these questions are difficult, and I look forward to the, that being reflected in the dialogue we have around about the uh, budget uh, settlement. Um, I can assure uh, Jackie Bailey that uh, I do intend to set out uh, a, a, a range of plans for future years uh, in the budget, so she will not be disappointed by my perspective around uh, the uh, issues that we face over the course of the spending review. Um, in relation to the use of the new powers, um, then of, I, I hear what she says about uh, air passenger duty and the top rate of tax. Uh, I suppose the, uh, the decision of the Chancellor liberates the Labour Party from having to explain how they were going to spend the air passenger duty money twice, which was a little local difficulty that they managed to get themselves into. Um, and of course, the new powers are there to be used, and we on this side have our own views about how those powers can be used effectively, and we'll set those out in due course. On the final point that uh, Jackie Bailey raised on the fiscal framework, um, I, 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 I rather take from her remarks today and also from her remarks at the weekend, that Jackie Bailey is in what I would describe as supportive mode on the fiscal framework. Or that's what, it, or that's what, I'm, that's what I'm cheerfully telling myself, that uh, she is. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's my one moment of optimism this week, pres presiding officer. Um, but I do hope that the Labour Party engages seriously on the substantial questions that are at stake in the fiscal framework, because regardless of the political leadership of the parliament, uh, the, or, or the government, uh, the issues that are involved in the fiscal framework inv affect every single one of us and every one of the individuals that we represent. And I think the stronger view that can be expressed on this parliament and the more cohesive view that can be expressed in this parliament, the better in advancing these issues. Yeah. Margaret Fraser. Thank you. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for advance copy of his statement? Although I thought he might have had a more cheerful disposition today. Yeah. For years, he has been calling for more money for capital spending, and the Chancellor has delivered a 14 per cent increase. And following the Chancellor's decision not to proceed with the cuts to tax credits, thanks to the intervention of my colleague Ruth Davidson, amongst others, the Deputy First Minister no longer has to find the money from his budget to fulfil his colleague Alec Neill's rash promise to make up any difference. Now, the Deputy First Minister makes reference to welfare spending. Can he just confirm? that the devolution of extensive welfare powers in the Scotland Bill will give this Parliament the option to take a different approach to welfare in future, if it wishes, and if it can find the money. And secondly, as he now has his long-awaited increase in capital spending, 
When will the Deputy First Minister be in a position to publish his list of shovel-ready projects that can now be pushed ahead? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, first of all, on the question of um, capital expenditure, and um, uh, Murdo Fraser uh, tells me that I've got uh, this tremendous uplift in capital expenditure. When, I, when the Conservatives came to office in 2010-11, the capital budget in cash terms was £3,293,000,000. Million. By the end of this decade, 10 years after the dark years of Conservative government, the capital budget in Scotland will be £3.187 billion. Pounds. So even after 10 dark, long, weary, cold years in cash terms, the budget doesn't even recover to where it was in 2010-11. And if we put inflation into account, it will be £600 million pounds less than when the Conservatives came to office. So it's, it's, it should be no surprise to Mr Fraser that I'm not in a more cheerful disposition <laughs> today, although I am trying my best to cheer him up. Um, uh, on the question of welfare spending, uh, yes, uh, there will be the choices and the options available to the Parliament to take a different course in relation to welfare expenditure. And of course, this government is already doing that. We're taking a different approach on council tax uh, benefit and council tax reduction. We're taking a different approach in relation to the mitigation of the bedroom tax. We're taking a different approach in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund. So I think there is ample evidence of this administration taking action to take a different course on welfare where the opportunities arise for us to do so, and that will remain our position in the years to come. Before I ask other members uh, to ask a question, can I just point out time is very, very limited. Uh, so the longer you take, the less time one of your colleagues is going to get. Indeed, one of your own colleagues will probably drop off the list. Uh, so if you take more than one question, you're to blame for your colleague. John Mason, followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy uh, First Minister mentioned the carbon capture and storage proposal that is being scrapped, and I just wonder if he could expand on that and explain the impact on Scotland. First Min Deputy First Minister. Well, I think that this, this is really a, a, a missed opportunity. Uh, when this government came to office, the possibility of a carbon capture and storage proposition at Peterhead was very much on the agenda. It then shifted from Peterhead to Long Annet, and then it it did not go forward at Long Island, and it went back to Peterhead, and now it's going nowhere. And this is innovative technology. And anyone that heard Professor Stuart Hazeldean on the radio this morning, I thought speaking very powerfully about the missed opportunity to take a significant step forward in technology development and also to make a significant contribution towards our ambitions on climate change, which would not be significant just for Scotland or the United Kingdom, but could be significant globally into the bargain. So... That is why we are making the strongest possible representations, not just because this is a lost economic opportunity in the northeast of Scotland, but because it is a major opportunity where Scotland could be exporting technology right across the world and, and, and helping to address a major issue that affects all jurisdictions around the world. Well, Rennie, followed by Christine Green. Uh, can I thank the Finance Secretary for an advanced copy of his statement and can I urge him, when he's considering his budget, to think about the mental health issue I raised earlier on today at FMQs, but also the A9, possibility of accelerating the programme for the dueling of the A9 with his extra capital expenditure. So the question I have is, despite his claims about land and buildings transaction tax, he is falling behind his forecast. The OBR have revised down their projections too, not just for this year, but for future years as well. Can he tell me what projections he's got? Does he agree with the OBR? And does he think the decline is going to continue? Deputy First Minister. Um, on, uh, first of all, Mr Rennie's point about mental health, I, I recognise the issues. That he, obviously, Mr Rennie had the opportunity to question the First Minister about this issue today. And uh, she has uh, made clear the attention the government will pay to, to that particular issue. And on the A9, I know that Mr Rennie will be uh, pleased to welcome the work that's going on at King Craig to Dalradi, um, which is the first part of the A9 dueling proposition uh, that has been taken forward by the government. On his final point in relation to the, um, the estimates, the forecast being made by the OBR, uh, I, I did welcome what the OBR said yesterday of revising their forecast into line with the Scottish Government's forecast. I, and, and, the, and Mr Rennie is correct to say they've reduced their forecast. They're absolutely right to reduce their forecast because I thought their forecast was way off beam in terms of the preparation that they undertook. So, and I, and I, I set that out to Parliament, 
and I'm, I can't remember if Mr. Rennie was critical of me about that estimate. I, I think maybe Mr. I might be accusing Mr. Brown of something he didn't do, but I'm pretty sure he was probably critical of me about it. Just and it looks as if it looks as if my position has been closer to the position uh, that will eventually transpire. Mm -hmm. um, we will set out at the budget in December our future forecasts in relation to um, land and buildings transaction tax, and obviously they'll be available to be scrutinised by the Fiscal Commission and by Parliament. Christine Graham, followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I note that over a decade the Tories will have cut our budget for public services by a cumulative 12.5 per cent, a substantial cut in anyone's book. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how he sees this might impact on the policing budget, particularly when there will undoubtedly be increased demands on our police due to heightened security? Deputy First Minister. It, it, clearly, Presiding Officer, the importance of, um, of maintaining uh, an effective police force that can address all of the requirements that uh, we have as a country, whether that's in relation to local policing, but I suppose ultimately everything is local policing uh, when you think about it, um, uh, and also some of the more uh, sophisticated work. You know, we, we were involved just last week in an extensive discussion about cyber resilience, and I set out the government's cyber resilience strategy, which has been heavily influenced by the contribution of Police Scotland. Um, it's important that we ensure the police service is uh, appropriately resourced and those considerations will be part of the discussions I take forward with the Justice Secretary in formulating the budget, which will be shared with Parliament on the 16th of December. Jenny Mara, followed by Stuart McMillan. While the UK government reduced spending overall, in England it increased investment in the NHS and allowed for further revenues to be raised for social care. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that if he passes on cuts to local government, the consequence could be reduction in social care budgets? What will he do in his budget and with the new powers that are coming through the Scotland Bill to make sure that our councils can pay for social care? Okay, First Minister. I think the first point in, in addressing Jenny Mara's question is to acknowledge the fact, and I think this has now been quite broadly understood within Scotland, is that the budget that we face involves a, a real terms reduction in the resources available to us over the course of the spending review. And it's a serious reduction on top of very serious reductions that have taken place over the course of the last five years. Uh, so that, uh, that cannot be escaped, and this is in a sense was my point to in response to Jackie Bailey, that I thought in Jackie Bailey's uh, uh, question there was an acknowledgement of the challenge and the difficulty that lies at the heart of the budget settlement. Uh, I also accept that we, we operate an integrated health and social care system whereby the contribution that's made on social care uh, can have an effect on the delivery of health care and the delivery of health care can have an effect on social care into the bargain. Uh, that is why we took the decisions to integrate health and social care and why we are advancing with such speed to ensure that the, the gains and the benefits of creating that integrated service are felt by members of the public and that the services that are delivered are sustainable. So these questions will be at the heart of the discussions that I take forward on the uh, budget issues and are discussions that uh, I will take forward uh, with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities in, with whom I am in regular discussion. Stuart McMillan, followed by Ian Gray. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would be grateful if the Deputy First Minister could confirm that, as a result of the hub projects that uh, he has announced today, that the multi-million pounds Invercloud Continuing Care Centre project will now proceed. Deputy First Minister. Uh, I am able to give that confirmation, uh, Presiding Officer. The Inverclyde Care Home is one of the projects that will be um, given the green light as a consequence of the announcement that I make to reactivate the uh, hub programmes, uh, which are a consequence of the uh, decision that we have received from the Office for National Statistics. Ian Gray, followed by Christina McKell. Thank you, President. Officer. Yesterday's statement uh, set out some details of expected income from the uh, apprenticeship levy. Uh, and previous parliamentary answers in Westminster indicate that when it is spent, the consequentials will flow to the Scottish bloc. Uh, there could be almost £1 billion in consequentials over four years. Will the Cabinet Secretary give a guarantee today, not just to me, but to those companies who will pay the levy, that he will use this to expand the Scottish Government Apprenticeship Programme? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I hear what Ian Gray says, and, and uh, the, uh, some of the information that he uh, surmises from the announcements yesterday 
um, may well turn out to be correct in relation to the revenue that is raised. But I have to say to him, we are at a very, very early stage in discussions about the implementation of the apprenticeship levy, even, I would say, a very early stage in the design of the apprenticeship levy with the United Kingdom Government. So uh, I do not feel as if I'm in a position to have any detailed information that I can share with Mr Gray today. It's a subject of uh, great frustration for ministers in this administration, and uh, the Fair Work Secretary had a discussion with her counterpart in the United Kingdom Government again this morning on this question, and we uh, will, uh, and the Fair Work Secretary will update Parliament on the progress that we make on some very detailed questions that uh, underpin the question that Mr Gray has asked. Christina McKelvey, followed by Gavin Brown. Thank you very much, President Officer. Deputy First Minister, La Lanarkshire Labour's councillors are engaged in a bit of a pathetic protest outside today. But does he agree with the assessment of Spice? who said that local government has been, a good, has been given a good deal by the Scottish Government and will continue to be given a good deal by the Scottish Government and the council tax freeze is overfunded. Can you tell us if councils south of the border have had such a good deal? Get the First Minister. I think um, it's, always, it's, it's always nice to welcome guests to Parliament. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the point I would make to Christina McKelvey is that the, 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 the work that was undertaken by SPICE over the course of the last few weeks demonstrated that the council tax freeze that the government has put in place has been fully funded, in fact suggested that it had been overfunded by the government given the level of inflation that has been prevalent within Scotland over the years. And it, compared to local authorities in England, local authorities in Scotland have been given very substantial financial support and advantage compared to local authorities south of the border. And as I indicated in my answer to Jenny Mara, uh, I will continue my discussions with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to work in a, a spirit of partnership to uh, navigate our way through these challenging financial times. Gavin Brown, followed by Siobhan McMahon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The um, NHS south of the border sees a real terms uh, growth rate of 3.6 per cent in the next financial year. Is the Cabinet Secretary going to give a similar commitment to Scotland next year? Well, what the Government will do will be to fulfil our commitment to pass on to the Health Service in Scotland the Barnet consequentials that arise from the Comprehensive Spending Review. That was our commitment, that is what we have delivered and that is what we will continue to deliver. Siobhan McMahon, followed by Patrick Hart. The Institute for Fiscal Studies highlighted at the UK general election that the SNP and Tory spending plans would have equal cuts, whereas Labour plans would have resulted in an increase in public spending. Is it not therefore the case that the SNP spending plans, as I said, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, is it not therefore the case that the SNP spending plans would also have meant cuts to the budget, hitting our frontline services such as local government and the NHS the hardest? Um, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not quite sure what conclusions Siobhan McMahon could deduce from the analysis that she has highlighted there that would suggest that um, the, the SNP was in any way taking a position of that sort. And I would just encourage Siobhan McMahon to reflect on the outcome of the election where analysis of that type did not exactly work out in a convincing way for the Labour Party in Scotland. Uh, the SNP has argued and the Scottish Government has argued that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I argued this just in a letter to the Chancellor of the Exchequer the other day, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has significant flexibility in, uh, in, in taking a different course to the austerity agenda that he has taken. And he could have invested uh, while still repairing the, the, the debt and the deficit and by ensure, and, and, and in, in moving the public finances into a sustainable position, he could have allocated an extra £150 billion to public expenditure, and I wish he had taken that course of action. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The cancellation of the carbon capture project is, of course, very regrettable. But it does, if that project does not go ahead, it does leave in tatters the idea that energy policy in Scotland or the UK can be predicated on continued electricity generation from fossil fuels. Uh, isn't it time to commit to a, a timescale to phase out fossil fuel electricity generation and commit instead to the infrastructure projects produced by the Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force, the kind of projects that would help build the low carbon economy that year on year we have been failing to do in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. I think, we've, well, I, I think Mr Harvey uh, um, has got to take into account the fact that very strong progress has been made by the Scottish Government in expanding the proportion of our 
energy that is generated from renewable means. And we have made very significant progress. We've made very significant progress also in reducing our carbon emissions over the period uh, that we have been addressing this issue. And nobody can dispute that volume of progress that the government has made. Our task would be made a bit easier if we had some degree of consistency and order in energy policy from the United Kingdom government, which has caused mayhem in the renewable energy sector and has just abruptly halted the carbon capture and storage programme and, 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 and are prepared, as Professor Hazeldean said this morning, to commit us to unsustainable levels of subsidy to the Hinkley Point nuclear power station as just one example of the folly of their energy policy. So whilst we are making good progress here in Scotland, and we will continue to endeavour to do so, and by following some of the examples that Mr Harvey has raised, we cannot disguise the fact that we are, our challenge is made greater by the, uh, the, 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 the foolishness of UK energy policy and the damage that has been created for the people of Scotland. Thank you. That ends the statement from Deputy First Minister. I apologise to the two members I couldn't call.